glory, glory, glory to God. That is just a great word and a great truth. And we have, uh, we, we've looked at uh, the basis of that thought and that concept about the goodness of God uh, in this series. And it's a wonderful little intro. Thank you guys for, for that. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> you know, you inspire. It's amazing how, how closely God inspires many times our praise and worship and what he's got to say to our heart uh, about things. You know, I, I, that's just a God thing. Seriously, it just really is. It's, a, it's not a carefully planned strategy. It's just a God thing. That it, you know, The inspiration of what happens with our worship and our praise and what God is saying to our heart out of his word and with me is just, uh, I, God just dovetails them right here together. The goodness of God we saw in Exodus 34 a couple of weeks ago in connection with God because Moses didn't know who God was. You remember that? And, and Moses said, you know, uh, you're bringing the children of Israel out of, uh, out of the desert and, uh, and, and, and you're putting up with a lot of junk from them and you're in spite of their disobedience and irreverence and breaking of all the commandments before you even give them to them. <laughs> They're down there dancing around some golden calf while I'm up on the mountain getting the commandments from you. I mean, they're trying to make some golden calf a god, and, and, and I haven't even gotten down off the mountain, and yet you uh, have spared them, so you're going to have to explain to me uh, what I don't understand about this. And God said, all right, you stand over there in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to put my hand over you, because if I don't put my hand over you, my glory is going to annihilate you as, as I pass by. Uh, my, my glory is going to blow you up. Uh, your flesh can't, can't stand the glory of God. And you stand over there, I'm going to put my hand over you, and I'm going to let my glory pass before you. And when I pass by, I'm going to remove my hand, and you can see the hind parts. You can see the backside of glory. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened. And then uh, as soon as God moved his hand, Moses uh, saw the goodness of God. The verse says, and God let his goodness pass before Moses. And Moses said, he, there, there are seven attributes to the goodness of God. You remember this? I know some of you may be recalling this, that God said God is merciful. God is uh, gracious. God is long-suffering. These are, this is what the, the goodness of God looks like, these seven attributes. This is what the goodness of God is and what it means. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's mercy and it's gracious and it's long-suffering. It's abounding in truth. It's abounding in goodness. It is forgiving and it is just. And those are the seven attributes of the goodness of God. And that's what the goodness of God is made from. And Moses, as soon as he saw that, the Bible said he fell down and he worshiped God. The first time Moses ever worshiped God is because before he knew about God, now he knows God. There's a lot of difference between knowing about God and really knowing God. And what God wants to do in our life is he wants us to know him, to fellowship with him, to be in his presence, to walk with him and let him walk with us because that's what empowers our life. That, that, that's the difference between the life of a Christian and, and the life of other people who try to practice, quote, religious things. Because you know that Christianity is not a religion. A religion is, is man's attempt to get to God by doing good stuff, by doing righteous stuff or holy stuff or better stuff or living a better life. It's man trying to work his way by his own merit into the presence of God. Christianity, on the other hand, is God's effort to reach down to humanity and say, you'll never get to me without my grace. And so here I'm giving you my grace. Ride on grace. Hold on to grace. Understand grace. And you can come to me because I'm giving you what you need because I love you so much. And so God says uh, it's important how you see me. Because if you don't see me right, you're going to be afraid of me. I mean, it, really, uh, our, our nearness to God, our closeness to God, will never get any closer than our concept of God will allow. In other words, if you see God as the mean ogre up in heaven 
with the Ten Commandments in one hand and a bat in the other hand, saying, just break one more of these. I can't wait. Boy, I'm ready to just smash you because you are, you never obey. You never behave. Ooh, I'm gonna, I mean, if that's your image of God, you're not going to draw close to that. You're going to stand back from that because you're afraid. You, and your, your concept of God is that he's an ogre in heaven that is looking for a reason to just smash your life. That's the way, and he's angry and he's bitter and he's hostile and he's looking for a reason to get you. God's out to get me. God doesn't want to bless my life. God wants, wants to punish my life. And if that's your concept of God and how God operates and how God works, you're never going to be close to God because if that's what you believe, you're going to stand back from God. So God says, it, it, it's important what you believe about me. So this, this, this series in grace is an effort to say, here is how God is. See God the way he really is. Because if you see him the way he really is, you will be drawn to come and sit in daddy's lap because daddy will, will be a whole different person than the devil would have you believe that God is. In every way in life, we have an enemy of our soul, a devil, who tries to take advantage of the fact that we are susceptible to be deceived because we are flesh, our, and our flesh is fallen flesh. It, it's, it's incorrigible flesh. It, it cannot be changed. It cannot be altered. We can't change this flesh for the rest of our lives from the time we're born until the time we go to heaven or maybe some of us that might be alive when Jesus comes. You know, From that, from that birth until then, uh, we have a problem. The problem is we have a flesh that we can't control. And it can't be changed. And God doesn't expect it to change. And, and now, that might sound a little funny to you, but, but, but that's why Jesus came. Because God knows that we can't change our flesh. The Bible says that we wrestle with our flesh. But we can't defeat our flesh. It's too powerful. It's too strong. It, it's fallen. It's weak. It, it, and it drags at us at every opportunity. And so Jesus came so that the grace of God can overpower the, the flesh of our lives. And we can become usable by God and close to God. The devil is, is the hurt whisperer. Whenever you hurt, the devil sidles up beside you and says, I told you God didn't like you. I told you he was just looking for a reason to punish you. Hey, listen to me. God hates you. you he, he wouldn't want to be around you. And if he did, look, look how he's punishing you. And the devil just whispers in our ear when we hurt in order to take advantage of our weakness, our concepts. And so we're in constant battle in life as, as the Holy Spirit moves in our life in order to bring us close to God and to walk with God. I mean, God, God doesn't expect us not to sin. He knows us. He knows our flesh. He knows what's going to happen. He knows our fallen nature. And so instead of demanding for us to perform better, come on, man, can't you do better than that? Can't you be stronger than that? How many times are you going to fall for that trick? My goodness, man, come on. You got probably, you need to get better. You need to be stronger. You need to, you know, can't you do better than that? And we say, no, we can't. That's why we need the grace of God. Because we can't do better than that. And God says, let me bless you by giving you power that can fight this flesh that you live with in life. And today, one of the concepts that I want to share with you as we move on through this grace of God, look at who God really is, is, that, is that, that God is the one who works in our life, and it is the grace of God that works in our life to overcome the weaknesses of our life. Let me just take a poll. Let me see if I'm talking to the right crowd. Uh, I'm not going to ask you what they are. But I'm going to just ask you, do, 
Do any of you have any weaknesses that you wrestle with in life? Everybody, and I look around. I mean, just look around at all the hands. Everybody in here, I mean, they have their hands up. Yeah, I, I just want you to see that <laughs> we all struggle with weakness in life. And you say, well, you know, weakness, what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about those, those things that so easily beset us. I'm talking about our attitudes our actions, uh, the strategies of life, the, uh, the, the, the understandings of life, and all of those kind of issues of life. And so God says, let me, let me share with you uh, what I have for you that will, that will change the weaknesses of your life, that will, in, that will bring out the best in you instead of allowing you to become susceptible to the enemy. Because listen, you know where Satan works in your life? In the weaknesses of your life. He takes advantage of these weaknesses. This is where he operates. Satan operates in the darkness. You remember the first thing God did in the Bible? The first thing God did in the creation of this earth, it said, and the Spirit of God moved over that vast openness and that darkness. And God said, the first thing God did, God said, and let there be light. And then God did everything he did in the light. God does everything he does in our life in the light. If it's in the darkness, it's the devil. The devil operates in the darkness, in the weakness, in the cover-ups of life. And the devil uses shame and fear to push us away from God so we will try to hide somewhere and not be in the light of God. God works in the light, guys. God doesn't work in the darkness. It's the devil that works in the darkness. And so he pushes us toward the darkness by, by opening up our life to shame and fear. Because the number one need that you have as a human being is you have the need to be loved. Now, I'm not just talking about husbands and wives and, you know, the wife needs to know that her husband loves her and the husband needs to know that the wife respects her, uh, respects him. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a relational thing. That's a personal thing between two. I'm talking about just in life, in general, everybody, every human being. Every human being, number one, number one need in life is to be loved, to be accepted, I mean, we do what we do in order to be accepted, to, to receive acceptance in life. I mean, we, 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 we talk to people, we work for people, we uh, have relationship with people, we, we do the things in life so that people will see us and people will accept us and people will say, admire us a little bit and brag on us a little bit and, and, and like what we do and want to be around us and invite us to their socials and, and smile at us. And, uh, I mean, that's acceptance. That's love. We, we, we receive that as love in our life. Well, if love is our number one need, rejection is our number one fear in life. None of us want to be rejected. None of us want to be disapproved of in life. Now, the devil knows this, and so he uses this in able to, for him to control our life. The hook, let's just say, that the devil has is the fear we have of being rejected in life. Nobody wants to be rejected. Nobody wants to be looked down on. Nobody wants to be, have others look at them with disgust or contempt or weakness or pity. You don't want people to roll their eyes. You don't want people, you know, I mean, there, there are lots of ways that we, can, that we can reject each other. In counseling, let me tell you, the, the, the deepest scar that I find on people's lives in counseling is the scar of rejection. They've been rejected by their spouse or rejected by their parents, or rejected by their children, or rejected by their, their friends or their work. I mean, the, the, the scar of rejection is the deepest scar that I find that people have in their life that, 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 that needs to be healed in order for them to have a, a proper relationship and a proper view of themselves in life. So we don't allow ourselves to do some things that God might be speaking to us about. You know why? We're afraid that we're going to be rejected. 
I mean, every one of us in here know that one of the main jobs of a Christian, how many of you are Christians? All right, I'm seeing every hand in here. All right, we all know that one of the main jobs of a Christian is to share your faith. I mean, talk to other people about Christ and try to influence them to go to heaven with you. That, that's one of our main jobs. And I would ask you, but I don't want to embarrass everybody, including myself, how many of you do this? Well, it probably wouldn't be very many of you. And the reason why, why don't you do that more? Because you're afraid. You know what you're afraid of? That people are going to reject you. That when you start talking about this, they're going to push away from you. They're going to reject you. I'm just using that to show you what rejection is and, and how it occupies the thoughts of the things we do in life. And I bring this up now because if we're going to be used by God, we're going to have to get past this fear of rejection. Because if we're going to live for God, God is going to take us into situations and, and, and call us into opportunities and, and move our lives in certain ways where if we live in the Bible, the, theologi the, the, theologi the theologians have a term for this, need, this, this fear of rejection, and it's called the fear of man. This fear of man. Satan controls us by the fear of man. He pushes us into the darkness. He keeps us away from the light. He pushes us over here when God says, get over here. Uh, it's, he, he uses this. This is a time-tested and tried tactic of Satan. This is what happens to us in life because uh, we're, so, we're so fearful of God because we don't know who God is because we don't understand God. And Satan takes advantage of that by keeping us deceived and keeping us in the darkness about how great God is, how merciful God is, how gracious, how, how, how much he wants us in spite of ourselves, how much power he'll give us to overcome that, 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 that weakness in life. That's what God is. And God says, come to me and I'll do all of this. And Satan's over here. Every time something happens in your life, whispering to you and saying, see there, I told you God doesn't love you. If he loved you, look over there at them. They don't even know God, and they're blessed beyond measure. And you look at your little sorry backside. You have nothing. You're a bum. You're weak. You're pitiful. God doesn't love you. And he, he's a hurt whisperer. And he does that in order to keep you away from God. And I'm just saying, if you can see God as he really is, that little party by Satan will be over with in your life because you will understand the grace of God and you will run to God instead of running away from God. And when you run to him, God can heal your life. God can change your life. And I'm saying God can do it without willpower and without any struggle in your life. Now, I know you're going, wait a minute, what did you say? I'm telling you that you don't need willpower. It doesn't matter how much willpower you have, you're not going to be able to change your life. Nobody is. Do you realize that, that a few days ago we, we crossed into January 1st and what that is is a resolution day, right? Do you know that according to Nielsen Analytics, that that that, that that 64, only 64% 64 of the people who make resolutions on January 1st by February 1st are still keeping those resolutions. And only 46% of those who made those resolutions January 1st are still keeping them after six months. And only 12% of those who made resolutions on January 1st are still keeping those resolutions on January 1st of the next year. I'm just saying that to say to you, that's the flesh. I mean, no matter how much willpower you have, your willpower is not going to overcome the flesh. And no matter how much determination you have, I'm determined not to do this. I am not going to ever do that again. I'm going to, man, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to quit doing that. Bless God, Lord, I promise you, I'm going to quit that and I'm going to overcome that. 
And, you know, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to quit eating so much that I'm going to get my little fat backside uh, in shape. And, and so you start going to the gym and you start eating right. And, man, you are just doing it. You are, your determination is pushing you. And you go every day and you're working out as hard as you can. And you're eating right and you're doing good. And then the, and then the next month, boy, you're doing good. You're losing weight. It's coming down. You're beginning to shape up and look good. And then you do it the next month. And then eventually, uh, uh, boom, they find you dead in the back of a donut shop. Uh, you, you went in... You broke in there at night after the business was closed and you got back there and binged on donuts and you died of sugar poisoning, right? You know, right there in the middle of the thing. Why? Why? Because determination, follow me now, determination is like taking a rubber band and winding it, right? You've done this before. You wind, all right? Every time you succeed, you wind. Uh, You do it again, you wind, you wind, you wind. All right, you're winding a rubber band like this. Well, you know, you can wind it for a long time, right? Well, but eventually, what's going to happen to that rubber band? Eventually, it's going to snap, right? And then, that's how willpower works in our life. See, the devil says, "Uh, you can do this. The devil says, see, the devil works both sides of the sin door. By that, I mean, on this side of the sin door, on the come in side of the sin door, The devil says, hey, come on in here. This is great, man. You're going to love this. There is nothing like this. I promise you, you've never seen anything. Come on, man. Come on in. Come on in. And then when we walk through the sin door, he jumps to the other side and he says, you are so weak. You are pitiful. Look at you. God despises you. Why can't I thought you were a Christian? You did that. He wor- so the devil works both sides of the sin door to entice us in and then to blow us up once we get in yeah, yeah. and push us into fear and shame so that we try to hide our weakness in the darkness. Where, and, and where does the devil work? In, in the darkness. When we pretend it's not there, when we try to cover it up, when we try to sidestep it and walk around it, when we don't talk about it to anybody, we never let any, and we think that people don't see it, we're hiding over here in the darkness because of the, of the shame that, that, that we have over it and the fear that when somebody sees my weakness, they're going to reject me because of my weakness. And I, I can't take another rejection, bless God. I mean, I'm fragile right now. I'm right, I'm hanging on the ragged edge. So I'm fragile. Well, God has a word for you. And the word is, I can change that weakness. Hey, I can make that weakness a strength in your life. As a matter of fact, what you're ashamed of, I love. You know why I love it? Because I work, I work in, the, in the weaknesses of life. It's, it's in your weaknesses that I can be made strong on your behalf because uh, uh, the potential for, the, for, for glorifying God is stronger in your weaknesses than it is in your strengths. I say that because if it's in our strength, we try to do it without God, right? I can handle this. This is in my wheelhouse. Uh, hey, yeah, okay, I can do this. This is no problem, no problem, no problem. And we walk forward in our strengths because uh, we can handle this. But in our weaknesses, we have to depend on God because we don't know what to do. We don't know how to do it. God, I don't even know how to get started in this thing. I don't know what to do. Lord, you're going to have to tell me what to say. Strengthen me in life. And we depend on God. And when we turn our, look, when we turn our, our hurts toward God, God begins to deliver us from those hurts. When we turn our hurts toward people, people get more condemning about us. People get, get more, uh, 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 get, get tougher against us. So uh, uh, the object, guys, the object is to not turn your hurt toward people, is to turn your hurt toward God. Because God joins in your hurts and strengthens you through those hurts. Let me give you, let me give you an example. This is the Apostle Paul. 
The Apostle Paul, let me give you the context of this. The Apostle Paul is being criticized for his weakness. Now, I know some of you are saying, man, the Apostle Paul, is just, he has a weakness. This is the Apostle that wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Maybe 14 if you count Hebrews, which many people feel that Paul did write Hebrews. So 14 out of 27, there are 27 books in the New Testament. He wrote 14 of them. He's one of the most brilliant people that ever lived on earth apart from Jesus Christ. He's certainly one of the most disciplined people on the face of the earth because he was a Pharisee. And the Pharisee, you know, they're a strict sect of the Jews, and they think you get to heaven by being good and by obeying the law. I mean, they have uh, 613 laws just concerning the Sabbath day alone. You can only walk this far. You can pick up your child, but if he has a rock in his pocket, you can't because that's working on the Sabbath day, you know, uh, that, that kind of thing. So a Pharisee is a disciplined person. And Paul, the Apostle Paul said, I'm not only a Pharisee, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I, I mean, if you think a Pharisee is disciplined, brother. I, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I was blah, blah, blah. I mean, he was bragging on how Pharisaical he was. So I'm just saying to you that you can't get smarter than Paul and you can't get more disciplined than Paul. And yet Paul is being criticized. Paul, Paul, what is happening to the Apostle Paul is the same thing we fear in life. And that is to be criticized and to be rejected because of our weaknesses. I asked you a few moments ago, I said, how many of you have weaknesses? And everybody in here quickly raised their hand. You know why? Because our weaknesses are very apparent to all of us. You don't have to think hard about your weakness. You know what it is. You know what they are, <laughs> mostly. Yeah. Because it, because it, it bothers you. I mean, it, 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 it frustrates you. You don't want it. And, and, and it's right here. And you, you know, it's right before you at all times. And, and so the apostle Paul is being criticized for his weakness. Apparently some uh, Jewish uh, the, uh, apostles have been traveling around and the church at Corinth, which is one of the churches that Paul started, Paul gave his anointing, Paul gave his uh, time, Paul gave his, uh, you know, probably gave him the credit card and said, all right, go down there and buy you some stuff so you can work with in the church. And blah. I mean, the apostle Paul was the apostle of the church at Corinth, but he had to travel because he was starting churches everywhere. And well, in his absence, some other little, some other little uh, uh, half-breed apostles came to that church in Corinth and tried to convince them that the Apostle Paul uh, really, wasn't that, what, really wasn't that much and, and you, should, you, know, be, you should let us be your apostle. And, and they began to put down on Paul and criticize Paul about his weaknesses and so forth. And in 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 12, the Apostle Paul defends himself to the church at Corinth and says, all right, uh, here's what I have to say about that. Now, the Apostle Paul knew what they were criticizing him about because he tells them in chapter 10 what he has heard they said about him. What he said that they said. <laughs> in chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, I know what you're saying about me. You know what they were saying about him? They were saying his, his letters are weighty and determined. In other words, when he writes something to us, it's tremendous. Paul is a writer beyond unbelief. And we know how he wrote because these books that we have in the New Testament are his letters. That's, those are his letters. So the Corinthians were saying, Paul, you know, we know, man, when, when, you, when you write to us, it is unbelievable and you are anointed and it is, oh, but when you come see us, Frankly, Paul, I mean, seriously, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but, but you're just not very good looking. And, uh, and, and you're a bad talker. Uh, your speech is contemptible. That's the way the King James puts it. Uh, uh, you're, you don't need to come down here so often is what they were saying. Just send a letter, all right? Yeah, yeah. We don't. We don't. We we would rather you just send a letter because your letters are just wow. But in person, you're a dud. Uh, and this is what they were saying about the Apostle Paul. Now that's hurtful, right? I mean, no matter what how you look at it, that's hurtful. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to them, 
and saying, here's my answer to your rejection of me. And this is what we're, this is what God is encouraging us all to adopt as the way God can work in us. And let me just read it to you, and, and then we'll, we'll shut it down in a second. All right, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I'll come, uh, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or whether out of the body I don't know, God knows, such a one was caught up into the third heaven. Now, what he, Paul's talking about there is you guys know that in Acts 14, the apostle Paul is stoned to death. Yeah, at Lystra, they, they stoned him to death. Yeah, he was dead. And they drug his dead body out of town. Yeah, and, and left him out of town. And Paul saying, this is what happened when I died. Uh, uh, my spirit was taken up into heaven. And notice what he said in verse three. And I know such a man, that's him, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for any man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. So the apostle Paul said, look, I know a man who, got, who went up to heaven and, got, and God showed him things that are, are, are inexpressible, uh, who had this tremendous experience with God. And this man could talk about this tremendous experience with God and everybody else would be put to shame because none of you have been to heaven, have you? So I could really boast in that. That would be something I could pump myself up. Boy, you would say, whoo, look at Paul. And you would almost worship Paul. But Paul said, that's not what God's about. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I'll speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. In other words, the apostle Paul says, you're criticizing me for a weakness and you say, I don't look good and my voice is bad. I'm a bad talker. And I'm telling you that there are many things that I could use to defend myself and, and just overpower your objections. But God doesn't want me to live that way because he doesn't want your criticism of me to control how I live my life. Paul said, oh, I could perform for you. I could let your criticism, you say I don't talk good? Well, I could start practicing how I talk and I could get more stately in my presentation and I could get better in my words and I could, I could get up here and man, I could become what you wanted me to become so you wouldn't reject me anymore. I could live my life that way because I would allow your rejection of me to control how I live my life. But the Holy Spirit has a word for me and a word through me, and the way I work is the way God leads, so I'm not changing my performance in order to please you in life. Now, that's what Paul's saying here. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, in other words, so that I wouldn't get too big for my britches, Paul said, a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's the attitude of life. That's the attitude the Apostle Paul had when he went to the Holy Spirit and, and placed his, his weaknesses, his critic, that the criticism of him turned it toward God. And God said, you know, you know what I'm going to do with your weakness? I'm going to make it your strength. The very thing that you think is the weakest thing in your life, when you turn it toward me, I'm going to take that weakness and I'm going to make it the strongest thing in your life because you know what I do with weakness? I love weakness, God says. God says I, the devil says to you, uh, God is repulsed by your weakness. 
The devil says, uh, uh, God doesn't want you. You're, you're pitiful. You're a stinking mess, man. Uh, get out of here. God, God, told, God holds his nose. God said, get out of here. You're weak. Get out of here. Why can't you be stronger? Why can't you be bolder? Why can't you be a better person in life? But God says just the opposite. God said, you know what? Uh, uh, your weakness and my strength match each other perfectly. Give me your weakness. Because it's in your weakness that I'm made strong in your life. And I love weaknesses. Just turn them around to me, man. That's all. Don't hide them. Turn them toward me. And the Apostle Paul here is basically saying, I'm not hiding my weakness. I, matter of fact, you know, you, you, you said I'm a, a poor talker and, I don't, and I'm not pretty. I, I don't, I'm not attractive. Uh, you know what? I agree with you. That's what he's saying. I, I agree with you. And what that means is, in order for us to be changed, we have to expose our weaknesses in life to God. Not try to hide them. If you try to hide them, they're never going to get. They're never going to change. They're never going to get better. They're going to push you into darkness and shame, and and you're going to stay there. But if you will expose them to the light, to God, He says, "I can do something with that." So where are you this morning? I mean, is that something that God's dealing with you in your life? I know, you know, in 2020. It's a good thing, right? 2020, 2020 vision, right? 2020 vision is perfect vision, right? Now, I know most of us, you know, we've been to the eye doctor and some of you got 2020 and some of you have 2015 and 20 whatever, but 2020 is perfect, right? So we're going to think 2020 is going to be God's vision, right? All right. It's perfect vision, it's God's vision. And I think this year is going to be a perfect thing from God. I think God's going to expose a lot of, a lot of truth to us this year that's going to affect our lives. And the first truth is that, look, in your weakness, God can be made strong if you will turn your weakness toward him and let him make the difference in your life. There's a big difference between the way people look at weakness and the way God looks at weakness. People look at weakness and think it's an inability. They say, you know what your weakness does, Paul? Your weakness makes you a dud. God looks at your weakness and God says, you know what I see when I see weakness? I see this is something that could be made into your strength. This could be, this could be the greatest thing in your life if you will just allow me to use you through this. Now, he's going to change you. It doesn't mean that your weakness is okay. It means that God has a plan and a pattern for your life, and only God knows what that plan and pattern is, and he'll take that weakness and turn it around and create strength in it. And it's going to change, but it's not going to be changed by you or me or anybody else in life because it's changed only by the grace of God. Only the grace of God has the power to change things in our life. It's not our willpower, not our determination, because our flesh is overwhelmingly powerful. And God knows it. And God's, God didn't even tell us to try to control our flesh. He said, listen to me. Let the Spirit come into your life. One, one more little thing, and then I, and I want us to pray. I mean... In Galatians 5, you remember, he said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Where does self-control come from in my life? But the fruit of the Spirit is. It comes from the Spirit. Not the fruit of your, the fruit of your determination is love, joy, peace. I'm determined. The fruit of your willpower. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, the, the fruit of your discipline. Uh, 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 no, the fruit of the Spirit. Discipline, self-control comes from the Spirit. Goodness comes from the Spirit. Gentleness comes from the Spirit. Love comes from the Spirit. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. That comes from the Spirit of God. What does that mean? Only God can do it in your life. You can't do this. And God knows you can't do this. Now, you don't have the excuse to sit there and do nothing because God says, give it to me and I'll do something with it. 
Look at it and call it what it is in your life. If, you know, if it's a sin, it's a sin. Say, God, I repent of this and I give it to you. And Lord, I, I, I just turn it over because I don't, I don't know what to do with this. It's beyond my control. I told you the way I've learned to pray now is to every day just tell the Lord. Many times a day, actually. Every time I pray, actually, I say, God, I'm just a child. I, I don't know what to do here. I don't know how to do this. I, I can't, I, I, I've, I've tried several things and I, I can't seem to have any effect on this in my, in my own life. I can't, make, I can't get these people to act right. I can't get that to work right. I can't get this to do right. Lord, it, it, it's, it, here it is. It's yours. Uh, come on, uh, Daddy, I got to have some help here. This is, this is yours. And God says, oh, I love it when you do that because Daddy can take care of it. Because he is magnificent, guys, and he loves you beyond your understanding. And he will do these things. Everything about God says that. Cast all your burdens on me, for I care for you. My burden is easy. My yoke is easy, and my burden is life, light. You know, let, let, let me do this. Let me work in this. And y'all will do it. All right, bow your head with me.